Hello, everyone, and welcome back to class meeting number six, part two. So th starting in this part here, Zach, I'm going to really hand it over to you for the rest of the, the class. The first thing you're going to... I'm going to go play with my helicopter. St ...start off with is, is reading a little something for us. First, go ahead and tell us what it is and a we'll, little backstory. Uh, what, I'm, what I've put together here is a quick read through of what I'm going to imagine would probably be about the first 30 minutes of gameplay, give or take, depending on how quickly you go through stuff. Now, earlier in a previous class, we had discussed that one of the concepts that had kind of appealed to everybody so far was just that you could jump into the game, choose what race you wanted to play, maybe a few uh, points of character customization in terms of what your character looks like, and then you just go. And yeah. the character... Uh, creation process doesn't bog you down with, well, what class do you want to be and what skills do you want to have and, and all that kind of... Because then you feel like you've got to go off to Google and start doing a lot of research because... And I, I generally do. Oh, I don't want to make the wrong decision now and have to re-roll. And, and also because no, but they don't really let you try any of it. you got to go in and play like the first ten levels of anything. Yeah, and really then get a And then re-roll, yeah. And I've now tried... Like, okay, take World of Warcraft, for instance. I think I've now tried every single type of character multiple times just mm -hmm. to see what they all played like. Sure, sure. And I don't necessarily want And we don't want to lock somebody into that. Plus, I really love the concept of getting somebody into the game quickly. I've right. selected my name. I've selected if I'm male or female. I've selected if I am human or Alethian. If I'm buffed or fat. And how cool would it be if we could actually have, like, fat body types? Why not? And Like, like... It, do you, anybody know like what the Violator looks like in the Spawn comics when he's in his human form? Like the really short, round, pudgy dude? That'd be so awesome <laughs> if I could be him. And then just hit go. Yeah. And begin crafting my character through living in this virtual world. And then um, if I don't like some of the choices I make, you know, backtrack. Exactly. All right. So, so uh, the only thing I will kind of throw out there is that I was told uh, to... <laughs> I'm sorry. DMJ said press the button marked awesome. It, Every morning. In our, um, so in our early alpha tests with students in the class, you're going to have to put an awesome button. <laughs> put an awesome button. And you just come up with some presets that makes it look like you or me and it'll randomize. Exactly. Pick one of those. <laughs> Looks like strong bad. Okay, so anyways. Anyways, so I was told to uh, write this without really worrying too terribly much about gameplay mechanics. Just write something uh, that seemed interesting reasonably feasible uh, within certain realms. And if we end up finding out later that some of the stuff that I describe here doesn't work, well, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, just the, the things that I write may end up opening doors for new ideas to be put in. So that's kind of where we are. And now this is only from the human side. That's right. I'm going to end up having to do this all over again for the Aletheans and how they're going to start it. And I am picturing the two starting off and experiencing the world in two very, very different ways. Mm -hmm. I really don't want this to feel... Well, uh, not, it's not only like WoW, but uh, Rift and probably every other WoW clone out there, where n the faction you choose is really almost just a cosmetic thing. I really would like things to feel very different from one to the other, so you really can get that sense of two clashing worlds. Whether or not that's a good idea, I don't know yet, but it's just it's what I'm hoping for. Anyway, so uh, let me get... My, get your water ready. Get my water ready because there's a... And get some heart ready, especially for that <clears throat> one Yeah, I know. Jarring it's it's moment. great. It's okay. Great. All right. Parker awakened inside the computer, floating in a sea of tiny blue stars. He looked at his hand, down the length of his arm, flexed his fingers. The muscles in his forearm tensed in response to the motion, and the glass-like skin with its geometrically etched surface moved smoothly over them. Almost real, Parker thought. The persona had been one of the prefabricated jobs that they offered as settlers as part of the travel package. He'd been jacked in for a fair percentage of his life, so he knew what to expect. Some sort of idealized physical form with all the right anatomy accentuated in all of the right trendy ways. This particular version was a lithe and masculine neuter with milky glass skin that reflected everything around it. Just underneath the surface pulsed bluish light that seemed to flow down an angular representation of a circulatory system. Across the surface of all of this were various geometric lines showing off aspects of the muscular form. If he'd bothered with switching to a third-person view of himself... He'd have seen eyes that were completely black, save for tiny cross, for tiny crosshairs at the center, orange lips that were painted with small upward curls at the corners, not unlike a harlequin smile, and a tall array of fiery orange crystals that sprouted from his head like a wild haircut. However, Parker did not bother with this. 
He glanced around at his surroundings. Three vast pillars stood on all sides of him, forming a triangle. Between each pillar was a walkway, each of which ended abruptly at a very plain black doorway. All of this was presented in the trendiest retro tech motif, where all things were illuminated and seemingly holographic. But Parker knew that if he touched any of these surfaces, they would feel as real as 23rd Avenue had in his previous life. As he looked around, words resolved over each doorway, orientation, the lounge, and sleep. It was a clever take on a pretty standard immersion interface. Orientation would take him to the... I'm sorry, orientation would teach him the basics of what he could expect on the colony, and more importantly, what was expected from him. Parker wasn't the kind to bother with that sort of thing normally. However, he knew that all of his actions would be monitored by corporate HR departments, checking for what they called compatibility. The lounge was just a time waster, for those who were stuck in cryo and bored. It offered an open area where other colonists could interact with each other's personas, play some games, and check up on the local news. Every immersion system out there had something like this, and it was very likely that this one was tied into the one on Aletheia, making it possible to start establishing contacts and meeting people prior to landing. The sleep door was just a way to skip everything. Since a settler could just as easily jack in and complete their advanced training once they made it planetside, there was really nothing saying they had to do any of this. By going through the sleep door and agreeing to a special indemnity clause, the settler's cryo-IV would get a rather heavy dose of drugs known as a comatose cocktail. Once it hit, you were out until another round of drugs pulled you back out after landing. He started for the orientation door. As he passed it, his persona trickled into the foyer of a large exhibition hall. The shape of the hall itself was nearly impossible to gauge, as from all sides he was accosted by the lights and sounds of various advertisements. A single path seemed to weave through the madness, branching here and there. Along this path were a series of booths and stalls, each one containing a digital representative persona designed to inform the user of their pre-programmed topic. The first of these was by far the most basic, and Parker was able to skip through the lecture fairly quickly. It overviewed his internal heads-up display, which would provide him with real-time feedback on his current status, any relevant combat data, a sat map, and a few other amenities. All of this was stuff he'd seen numerous times during his career, but he listened and made notes here and there about some of the newer systems. The next booth was one of those morbid sort of necessities that Parker loathed, but dealt with nonetheless. Life insurance. Over the past hundred years or so, biotechnology had progressed to the point that the human body could be cloned in its entirety. Artificial aging devices made it possible to generate a completely fresh replication of a human being in a matter of days. Add to this the advances in wet-loaded personalities, and it was possible to have yourself completely replaced in the event of your death. But nothing is free. The cost of coming back in one piece was a monthly insurance fee. There were various plan levels, with the most basic allowing you a body essentially like the one you left behind, but without any of the possessions you had prior to death. More advanced plans went all the way to luxury service, allowing people to come back in better shape than when they died. He chose to see a demo of the premium insurance claim service. The salesman pulled a large chrome pistol out of his jacket and held it up. Parker knew his guns. This was an Eagle Tech Hudson 16mm with anti-recoil module and laser sight, called a Hudson Heavy in the business. Flashy. Designed to be just as effective without ammunition, as it was very likely that someone staring down the barrel would have a sudden gripping desire to evacuate their bowels. Do you know what this is? asked the salesman. Parker had seen this tactic before. Use the fear of a gun to launch into some sort of diatribe about how important it was to be safe in an uncertain world and blah, blah, blah. But he humored the program as he had nothing better to do. Sure, it's an Eagle Tech. BAM! The blinding muzzle flash went unnoticed as the round found its mark between Parker's eyes. The effect was startling in that he actually felt a fairly painful impact that whipped his head back. He was pretty sure he could feel hot brain running down his neck. The entire simulation went black. When it faded back up, he was floating in a thin, jacuzzi-like tub. The room was warmly lit, with an interior decorated in the traditional Japanese style. Two beautiful Asian women in nearly two short silk robes helped him out of the tub and toweled him off. Parker was rather impressed with the simulation quality. Rather than his persona, he was looking at an extremely high-definition rendering of his own body. A small man on the far side of the room explained that this was the highest level of insurance claim handling and that he could expect only top-of-the-line service. 
As soon as the speech was over, the simulation once again faded to black, and he found himself back in front of the orientation booth, with the salesman continuing on about the added benefits of premium insurance policies. The unfortunate side was that, since he was no longer in the direct employment of Hamamoto Industries, he did not qualify for a corporate discount. Parker actually had died a few times, but his contract had allowed him a rather posh rebirth. Nothing as nice as the simulation he just witnessed, but not as horrible as he knew some of the lower-end policies could be. He would have to sacrifice such niceties for the time being, as his settler's allowance would not allow for the more high-end plans. He chose something basic that would allow for his body to be restored, along with the cyberware he'd had implanted. Moving on to the next booth, Parker was accosted by a typical real estate sales program, which cited all of the reasons why it would be in his best interest to purchase a luxury condo in downtown Salvation and how he could save money on the down payment by agreeing to purchase now. Parker didn't need any of that. He hadn't come to Aletheia to blow all his funding on anything that lavish. He scanned through a list of floor plans, but was accosted by a holographic ad that jumped out telling him of new high-end real estate ventures for those seeking to purchase their very own piece of Aletheian property. If he acted now, he could save 10% on a purchase, which included a prefabricated home installation. Parker flipped past. Owning his own piece, uh, I'm sorry, owning his own place on Aletheia was certainly an intriguing prospect, but nowhere near his current budget. He returned to the floor plans and tapped one that looked like it might suit him. He was given an option of a full immersive walkthrough, but decided against it. The price was right, even for a basic box. He punched in his credits, waited for the address to download, and moved on. The next booth involved a lecture on skill chips. These were a relatively old tech, though Parker had never bothered to get one installed. A small terminal was wet-wired to the brain, with chip slots mounted in the skull just behind the ear. Users could install various chips into these, granting them knowledge and skills. Sometimes the chips were, were time-based and would expire after a certain duration. Others were permanent. The purpose was to allow one to pick up new job skills, new languages, and so forth, just by slotting a chip. Parker had heard that they worked pretty well, and he'd probably get one soon. For now, though, he knew everything he really needed, and so continued past to the next booth. It was here that Parker realized that basic-level orientation was over, and that it was time to begin skill assessment and training. For placement in the colony workforce, a colonist needed to have certain sets of critical skills. These range from financial know-how to computer usage, mechanical engineering, medical professions, and even to combat. The interesting thing about these training booths, however, is that they treated you like you knew nothing on the topic. It would simply ask if you were interested in any given skill and then put you to work on some basic tutorials and verifications. If the system deemed that you needed further training on the topic, the critical information you'd need to perform that task was gradually loaded into your brain throughout the training program via slow, wet-written data stream. Though there was no set order for which a colonist could visit or not visit any of these booths, the first one to appear, as it so happened, was for training and assessment in personal combat. Elethia, as beautiful as it was, was still an alien planet with plenty by way of hostile environments. A colonist needed to know how to keep themselves and their families safe. Of course, that was the official rhetoric. Unofficially, the United Earth Hegemony government knew full well that it could not police the colonies of much criminal activity, and so colonists were encouraged to get some sort of self-defense training. This also served a dual purpose. Since the precarious peace between the humans and the Aletheans could technically be blown apart at any moment, it made sense to turn each and every willing colonist into some form of soldier. After about eight years in corporate security and, <clears throat> excuse me, and focus on a variety of clandestine ops, Parker was quite at home in the world of combat. He chose to start there. <clears throat> Selecting urban specialization with focus on firearms, close quarters, and defensive combat. He knew how to protect a group of people when he needed to. After making his selections, he was ushered through a door, which seemed to open into a large, pillared lobby area for a corporate office building. A voiceover instructed him that there was a hostage on the third floor that would need to be extracted. He was equipped with a pistol, a submachine gun, each with one magazine. He was also given a telescoping baton and a knife. The rest of the simulation was up to him. Parker expected something relatively entry-level, but was surprised when the difficulty of the simulation seemed to ramp up based on his tactics. He had just dropped his third guard and was making his way up the stairs—only a moron took the elevator in a situation like this— 
when the door below him blasted open and half a dozen special weapons riot guards stormed through, complete with laser-sighted SMGs and riot shields. His single submachine gun wouldn't even scratch the nanoplex glass of the shields, and he knew it. Time to run. He made it most of the way to the third floor when bullets started plowing up through the stairs around him. He took one round to the lower leg. The simulation did a good job. The pain was very close, and the difficulty for motion was dead on. He dove through the third floor doorway, only to find two more guards on the, on the far side, weapons drawn. Not riot guards, standard mall security types. Before he hit the ground, he was able to send a quick SMG spray in their direction. One guard was hit and went sprawling. The second opened fire but missed, giving Parker half a second to aim down the iron sights. Headshot. On his feet, Parker knew he had to get away from the door, but saw nowhere to go that would allow him safety. The corridor into which the stairs opened was clear to the left and right, offering a perfect straight shot for anyone wanting to take one. He could hear the guards storming up the stairs behind him, and only one thought came to mind. No time to plan. This had to go right the first time. He crouched low next to the door, waiting for it to slide open. He knew the guards would be using breach tactics, sweeping left and right with full cover, but the door was not wide enough for two to walk abreast, and the heavy riot armor of the first guard would act as a shield. As soon as the door slid aside, Parker swung upwards with his knife, burying it deeply between the first guard's legs. Warm blood ran down over his hand as the man buckled. Immediately, the crippled guard fired, but the bullets rang over Parker's head, deafening him. He reached up and grabbed one of the flashbangs on the guard's armor, pulled the pin, and shoved back with all his strength, his leg crying out from the bullet wound. As the injured guard fell back, Parker could feel his comrades riddling him from behind with bullets. None came through to strike him, however. And as the guard tumbled back, Parker was able to grab the door jam and pull himself back through, leaving the guard's body to collapse on top of the rest of the team, knocking several down the stairs. He had just enough time to slam the emergency close button on the door before the flashbang went off. Though even with his eyes shut tight, the small sliver left from the closing door was enough that he could see the intense light through his eyelids. If the sound had not further impaired his hearing, he would have heard the guards tumbling down the stairs after one another. But he was already up and moving down the hall toward his mark. The hostage was tied to a chair. To her left was a guard, his sidearm against her head. He was in the middle of giving some standard variant of one more move and she dies. Parker realized this was a simulation, but in the real world, if that had been even remotely on the guard's mind, he'd have plugged her when Parker made it to this floor. He wondered if the programmers had taken this into account and decided on a calculated risk maneuver. The guard had not yet delivered his first sentence. Parker already had his SMG trained on the man and decided on a trick shot he'd learned a few years back. It turns out that it's very difficult to pull the trigger on a gun when someone fires a burst of 12mm high-velocity rounds through your wrist. Firing from the hip, always a dangerous move, but aided by feedback from his cyber eyes, he had a pretty good feel for the shot. He sprayed a three-round burst which nearly tore the man's hand off, spraying blood on the hostage but otherwise leaving her unharmed. He put two more rounds in the man's head just to be sure, then began untying the hostage. As she stood, two more guards, the same riot guards as before, burst into the room. One of them trained his weapon on the hostage. Parker called out to the man, using a choice expletive he reserved for grabbing someone's attention in an emergency. As expected, both men turned. Parker had no body armor, and so dashed toward the men to close the distance. He was able to dislodge the first guard's riot shield and quickly crouch behind it, deflecting the incoming gunfire from the second guard. Drawing his pistol, he was able to push the two men back out the door with sheer firepower, though he was not doing much damage to their armor. Behind him, the hostage, apparently not completely ignorant of gun usage herself, grabbed the dead guard's sidearm and took position at an oblique angle to the fight, using Parker and the width of the doorway for protection. Between the two of them, they were able to keep the fight going just long enough for Parker to eventually find the jinx in the riot armor, allowing him to down the two guards. The simulation ended. Apparently, full extraction wasn't the actual goal. He trickled back into the orientation room and was informed by the man at the combat booth that he'd been certified for urban combat, specialization in defensive tactics, firearms, and CQC. It was time to choose his next skill. For his next choice, Parker went to a booth focusing on engineering and selected a specialization on mechanical security. It was no good trying to defend a group of people from an incoming threat if you were only to be stopped by a closed door. He found throughout the simulation that he had only known a few rudimentary tricks, and through the instructional videos and the immersion practical, he managed to discover a few new ways to bypass various doorways, traps, and other installed security devices. For his next skill, Parker selected basic medical. 
It wasn't anything too fancy, but he was able to see how he could patch together a few more wounds than he knew to begin with, a good skill to have if things got messy. He then chose some basic computing skills to round things out before he had filled up his allotted training regimen. Before moving away, he passed by two booths he'd not yet had the chance to visit, a financial booth that taught how to work the trade markets, and a piloting booth that covered the use of both Atmo and vacuum-based vehicles. Financial could be useful, but he'd have to look into it another time. Piloting was well beyond his funding level, but he had to admit it did sound like a pretty nice gig. Finally, with all of that done and his certifications earned, Parker moved out of the orientation room and into the lounge. Most of the passengers were here, their personas taking on a wide variety of forms. The room was large, not unlike a casino bar. There were several dining tables where people could actually sit down and order a meal if they liked. Apparently, Foresight had spared no expense in the immersion factor. A tall, balding barkeep stood behind the bar, perpetually polishing the glasses, offering drinks, and dispensing local gossip, which essentially consisted of celebrity and entertainment news. Over in the corner of the room, Parker saw what he was looking for, the virtual data console that would tie into the planetside infonet. He walked across the room and sat down. Like all colonists, Parker had a tiny personal data management subprocessing suite installed against the inner wall of his skull. It was wet-wired into his cerebral cortex and served as a permanent to-do list, GPS, clock, pager, instant messaging system, and calendar. Some nut jobs would crack these things and install video recording codecs, augmented reality systems, and even games. Parker wasn't into that sort of thing. Over the next few minutes, he scanned over a variety of classified ads. His newly certified status made several of these available that any non-certifieds wouldn't be able to access. In short order, he had filled his task backlog and stood up from the console. For his own amusement, Parker spent a while trying out some of the games. Some involved gambling, and the player could choose whether to play for sport or for credits. Others were more action-oriented. He ordered a strong drink from the barkeep and felt a slight amusement at the lifelike effect it had on his perception. As with all immersion systems, however, he was able to switch off the effect when he got tired of it. Having nothing more to do, Parker returned to the main, I'm sorry, to the main menu level and walked briskly into the door labeled Sleep. A prompt asked him if he wanted to sleep until landing. After giving an affirmative response, he waited just a few seconds and felt a gentle hum at the base of his skull. It swept through him, making him drowsy. However, rather than fall, he felt himself gently lifted, suspended in the air as the simulation faded to black. So there's our first part. Sorry, I have to wet my whistle. Yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> Not done. <clears throat> Not done at all. <laughs> oh, and I just want to throw this out real uh, every now and then. You'll notice I stutter or stumble. That's because this has not been edited, and I'm actually editing on the fly while I read. So if it takes me a second or if you notice some words are kind of out of whack, that's just, yeah, that's how it works. Anyway, continuing after a quick break. Parker's real-world awakening was not as peaceful. The reviving drugs, combined with certain strategic placements of electric shocks, caused his eyes to fly open. He felt a wave of panic pass over him and was consumed with a sense of terror as his hands found the walls of the blackened, coffin-like cryo drawer. A faint red light switched on, followed with a faintly feminine voice instructing him to remain calm as debarkation would commence shortly. Probably sounds just like the webinar chick. Gradually, the sensation of panic passed. He wondered how much synthetic adrenaline was used in the wake-up juice. While he waited, a series of lights along the corners of the cryobox got steadily brighter and brighter, preparing Parker's eyes for the lighting of the main cryo barracks. At last, the drawer opened, and he sat up and stepped out of his rack. To his left and right was a row of new settlers, all looking a bit groggy around the eyes, all dressed in the same one-piece skin-tight suit with its various IV and sensor ports. Directly across from him was another group of the same. As each person stood up, their drawer closed, and the illuminated arrows along the floor guided them along a line to an exit far to Parker's right. Here and there were technicians helping those who were getting I'm sorry, helping those who were going a little too slowly. The next several minutes involved picking up his new gear at the ship's quartermaster. Colonization rules were very strict, absolutely no possessions on the journey, and then make his way to the exit. <clears throat> As he walked down the ramp, Parker was filled with a strange mix of elation and disappointment. At eye level were all the same things he'd known from Earth. The same buildings, the same people, the same advertisements, almost as if he'd never left. The sky, however. The sky was a massive azure blue with brilliant white clouds as he'd never seen them. He could not stop looking up. 
dominating the eastern horizon was Niala, the large gas giant around which Aletheia orbited, and high in the sky were the twin suns Ganelon and Orilar. Both dimmer than his native Sol, these two stars shone together with a clear brightness that he never experienced in the primarily gray and greenish skies of his homeworld. Parker knew he could not waste time. The allowance given to all colonists would not get him very far, and he already had a task backlog with jobs that he, prob that he had probably accepted days ago now, perhaps longer. Fortunately, this was taken into account on the ship's job posting system, and most of the duties were fairly generic in nature, meaning that they had some form of consistent availability. Walking up to one of the security sergeants, Parker was instructed to follow his fellow colonists to the orientation area. He knew that this would consist primarily of what he'd already taken care of while in cryo, and instead asked directions on how to get into the inner city. He was quickly shown to a monorail system, which carried him off the landing area premises and into a series of stops at various points of the city. Parker's first order of business was to check out his domicile. He knew better than to expect very much. It was just a basic place to lay your head, but the first month's rent was provided by his colonization agreement. He left the train and quickly found the address. The building was fairly tall, with several balconies from luxury condos. His domicile, however, would certainly be underground, part of a seemingly endless array of cube-like racks. He spoke briefly to a disinterested woman at the counter, who pointed him to a lift that only went down. Can't have the lower class. I'm sorry. Can't have the lower class shelling elevators with a rabble, after all. Parker saw that there was no button, just a hand scanner. Upon placing his hand on the panel, the lift seemed to almost fire downwards, and Parker got the sickening sensation of something nearly like free fall. Just as quickly, the lift slowed, and the doors opened, depositing Parker on a gantryway lined on both sides with identical doorways. As he walked down the aisle, one of these opened, and he stepped in. The room was an eight-foot cube, comprised of a small sink in one corner that folded out into a toilet. The sink could also be extended and this nozzle modified to become a simple shower. Above this was a mirror, behind it a small cabinet to hold a couple of dishes. There was a thermo oven, a small couch, a basic immersion deck, a table, and a ladder leading upward to a bunk just above the couch. A few shelves had been bolted to the wall in case he wanted to put anything on them, and there was a large, coated storage locker on one side. No decorations. It was perfect. Okay, so, yeah, we'll stop the reading there. It does go on a bit longer, but... Uh, but that, that part's a little bit too rough. Yeah, moment. that's that still needs a bit more flushing out. Sorry, we'll try to have that soon enough. And and as far as the it does kind of sound like the, the comment that NATO thing. said sounds quite Avatar like. I think any travel to any distant planet now yeah, anyone's going to say, well, that sounds like Avatar. Yeah, I think uh, I think Avatar just kind of took exactly what we'd expect. Yeah. And, and that's and presented that's it to exactly us. how I mean, this is being presented. As you're you're going to have to get off of some sort of conveyance, and there will be some sort of a concourse-like area where someone's going to give you directions, and then you're going to have to take some sort of mode of transportation into the city. You're obviously going to be in some form of cryo. I mean, yeah. you've got to be in a deep sleep for something that's going to take a significant amount of time. But and I won't say that your options are sound like Avatar or sound like Star Trek. There's all kinds of things you could sound like. Yeah, I like what RME said. Yeah. Or Alien. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You get off you get off your, your shuttle and the whole mm. place is it's raining and dark. No, I'm just thinking of the uh the Sarge. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Bunch of badasses. <laughs> let's see. Um All but, right, people, let's move it. <laughs> <laughs> asses and elbows. Exactly, Action. exactly. Get, get over here. Which you want me to fetch your slippers for you? <laughs> Good stuff. Oh, right, sorry. But anyway, so that's it, it's kind of like doing a written storyboard to help us visualize some of the some of the things we would like to do, and it's it's off to a good start. It still needs a bit of polish. There's still a few things that we're looking at changing in what you've heard already. Um, we're not going to be posting this up in the lounge. I mean, I'm sorry, the MMO lounge anytime soon because this isn't done. You guys really got a, a sneak peek at this. Yeah, it's almost like a first stage of level design. Exactly. But uh, and it's way early for that sort of thing. But it's just a way to give us an idea of a uh, really general gameplay. Yeah. Really general. Gameplay. Yeah, very general. Neil says uh, so. If I get this right, the penalty for dying is paying credits. 
Well, in a lot of games, it always is. Um, but I think a lot of that, once we get to, especially to working out the, the whole idea of insurance, the penalty for dying is going to depend on a lot of factors. If you are coughing up exorbitant fees for a high level of insurance, yeah, the only cost for dying is just going to be some money. As a matter of fact, uh, the way I'd like to see it, and I'm, I may get argued out of this from you know between now <laughs> and then, uh, but like if you are paying like a ton of money, a very, very high fee, then you might actually come back with repaired stuff. It's like you actually end up not having to repair yourself after death. That's already taken care of for you. Or in WoWSpeak, you come back with buffs. Yeah, you come back with buffs. You actually <laughs> wind up better off after your death. But because, you know, on the flip side of that, you're coughing up a ton of Hang money. Hang on, let me, let, me, let me act out how one of our raids would be. <clears throat> All right, Zach, I know you've got the high-end insurance. We're about to do this boss fight here. I hate to do this yeah, to you. Go ahead but... and run on in there and wipe yourself real no, quick. No, I hate yeah. to do this to you. Blam! <laughs> All right. Zach will be back with us in just a moment, guys, but he'll be ready to go. <laughs> exactly. But anyways, um, it, it is one of the things that that we are playing with right now and yeah. that we like right now. Actually, it would, would be a really interesting thing, I think, to explore. It would be when you die, because what's the, the standard? And it's not just, wow, it's a lot of the MMOs and even RPGs that I've played. Uh, the whole idea of death means that you go back to your body in some form or fashion, and then you've got to repair or what you know, uh, get whatever you lost. What is in rift? You've got to have your soul mended, which I always thought was funny. Somebody stitching your soul back together. Uh, in WoW, of course, it's just repairing your gear. I think it would be cool if, and maybe this is again one of those things that I'll probably somebody's going to say, don't, don't ever do that. But, uh, okay, like, if you take the idea that you do wake up in some sort of a respawning vat, and then you're going to get sent back to wherever you left off, why not, when you're there, go ahead and give people the option of buying stuff? So go ahead and pay for some new buffs, pay for some new gear. The, you know, this fight was not working out because I had the wrong equipment. Just make it a little more convenient for people than it is now. Don't say, guys, I didn't bring my stuff with me. Does anybody, are there any engineers who have the remote mailbox so that I can get into my bank? <laughs> exactly. Tag with that, tag with that. Yeah, I mean, yes, I know there, at some point you're making the game a little bit too easy. But if the game is all about playing with your friends and, and actually, you know, trying to make it through a combat situation, then encourage that and, and make the rest of it as easy on people as you can. Oh, NATO. They're still spending a bunch of money on proper respawning anyway. Someone pop a repair bot. NATO, that's so two years ago. Now Jeeves. it stays as, where's Jeeves? Anyone Anybody got, got Jeeves? Jeeves? <laughs> Actually, it's fun when Jason and I go raiding because both of us have Jeeves so we can trade off. Yep. Which is very handy. Anyway. So... Are there any other questions or, or comments about this? And then we can get into a little bit of art stuff. Sure. And I'm not seeing any questions. And 3D Spider says that maybe having a premium insurance means you get instantly teleported back to where you died. Base insurance just spawns you in town. Damn it! They're having that raid 400 miles south of Absolutely. the... Absolutely. Um, but yes, that is. we did talk about... Several different things along those lines. You know, an interesting way to look at it, too, would be like you could have the flat monthly fee for the really, really good insurance that spawns you back. It's all your stuff repaired and all that kind of stuff. And all of the perks and everything are included. But you could get the low-level stuff, and you could buy all that stuff when you die at a premium. So it's like, all right, fine, well, go ahead and repair me, cha-ching. Go ahead and uh, teleport me back to where I was, cha-ching. Because that wasn't included in my policy, so now I have to pay a premium for it. Uh, let's see. And uh, Nelson wouldn't like insurance at all. That's stupid. Everyone dies. Yeah. Forcing them to pay for being alive is counterintuitive. Forcing them to pay for dying, I don't think, is counterintuitive. Generally, there is some sort of penalty with dying, be it wasting the time to walk back or... But everyone dies. I don't get what he's saying. I, I think he's just being argumentative. It's... No, 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 because we now have a new thing that we've said with him. If he's going to say something, it's something he means and he's going to stand by. He's not just going to bitch to bitch. Ah. So. I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't understand. Of course, what he's everyone saying. dies. Uh, you and I are going to die. Everyone here is going to die. Yeah, but we're, we're also talking about, you know, a gaming environment. Thousand years into the future now. I don't, I don't know how well the game would go if it was, all right, you're dead. Start a new character. Start a new character. <clears throat> 
Well, I kind of like the idea of life insurance is something you pay to stay alive as opposed to something you're paying in case you Well, die. what you're paying for – it's just like real insurance. You're paying for protection in the event of something cataclysmic in this particular case like your death. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, going, if, great, all that life insurance I'm paying for now, it, if I die, they bring me back. That's yeah, awesome. if, it, if it was as easy to repair your body as it is to repair your car, it would be the exact same thing as car insurance. Where the higher end policies will, you know, they'll put it in the shop, they'll give you a loaner, they'll polish the thing, they'll get it detailed while it's there. And then you get that, what, the liability only, where they cover whoever you hurt, but you're kind of up a creek. And yes, Gavin, there will be some sort of punishment for death in the end. I mean, we're just yeah. not going to make it to where it, it is actually a perk. But it still doesn't make sense. But then again, Nelson told me that regular renter's insurance doesn't make sense. So, of course, it's nice Say to have. Say that when your apartment burns down. Yeah, when something like your apartment burns down. But anyways. No, I was thinking there actually would be a very basic free resurrection, so to speak. So uh, if, you know, if you can't afford insurance or if you just don't want to pay for insurance. But that's going to come at a pretty heavy penalty. I mean, Nelson, you can, you can say something, right? I could have swore I heard your mic a second ago. He says no. All right, I'll remute him. Ugh. Too bad. Okay, he's eating and he's at work. So oh, I, got I understand. Anyway, so like I said, there there are a lot of little kinks there that are yeah, getting kind of worked all of out. This, we've already said all of this is rough, but at the same time, I, I'm not wanting to see. I mean, I know a lot of people like the boom, you're dead, hit the space bar, and hey, I'm back in, and let's keep going. And and well, I mean, Rift would be a whole lot more convenient if you could soul walk all the time. But even they realize that at some point there's got to be some kind of penalty for death, and so they not only hurt your soul, but eventually you have to spawn back at some graveyard somewhere and run all the way back to your body. Exactly, as you continue doing more and more damage and so, to your soul. Yeah, the penalty there is that you lose this soul percentage, which will eventually wear down on your skills. Yeah, evidently, I haven't ever got it down that far. And the amount of time lost, which can be kind of considerable for Rift anyway, uh, in a run back. But anyways. But if, uh, but if everyone wants insurance, then it's just a tax. Depends on how much they want to spend on it. But yeah, like I said, there's all kinds of little aspects to the mechanic. I know it can work, so I'm not really stressed about it. Not at all. Tax is good for the economy. Yeah, that's very true. As far as what's the Alethean equivalent, we've not been we've not been working. Well, Pro we, we've we've um, had we've had some discussions. Okay, I don't want to get into that though. All right, that's Zach fine. was about to share some stuff. But yeah, until fine. we get it a little bit more ironed out. So, when the insurance to scare new players off, here here's here's the deal with that. Keep in mind. There's already a lot of things we're going to be doing in this game that's going to scare people off. But simply put, I, I'm since we can design the game we want to design, we're not a studio with um, investors pouring millions of dollars into us that, that gives us that luxury to build the game we would like to see. And at the end of the day, nobody may like it. Well, and also, you know, you probably want to do little things like uh, give people their first death or two for free, or maybe like their first five deaths, you know, and, and then at some point and be like, you know, you, you're going to have to start paying for insurance now. Yeah. But like, there's little aspects of this that you're going to have to iron out. That's just how it goes. One of the things EverQuest did was you incurred no penalty for deaths for the first 10 levels. Mm. There you go. That's one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. One free death per day than insurance. Nah, I go entire weeks without dying. How many times did you die in WoW from 1 to 10? None? Yeah. I had to try real hard to die when I was really low level in WoW. And that was like by running into level 30 areas with no weapons. <laughs> I like what Moose said. Do it like real life. Your rates go up the more you die. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we've decided that you're a high-risk client, and so 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. We're sorry. I could tell you guys all about my car insurance after I had my accident. Whoa. See, Nelson's already seeing it. He's got to spend some money on something that you don't have to. It's not a requirement yeah. to spend money on it. See, and that's the way I, I mean, I if you want, I would go ahead and let it be free. And then it give somebody a chance, perhaps, to... Uh, to buy any additional services that they want, such as repairs at the moment that they respond, but they're going to end up costing a lot more. I mean, now, if you never die, maybe you'll save money like that. You know? Maybe yeah. if you're just that awesome. Okay. So, outside of the insurance things, any other uh, questions? Free tacos with each death. Mm, God, I'm hungry now. Thanks a lot, Gavin. Sweet. On the subject of skill chips. Yes. Totally ripped from the world of William Gibson. You guys leaning toward a skill point based system. I haven't really decided the specifics of that yet. I do know I want there to be separate skills. Whether or not each one of these skills can have their own points. Let me let me let me change that. There. We haven't decided on that yet because when we get into the whole skill thing, that's something that's been under great discussion here. Oh, I just meant in the context of what I was writing. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's it's at this point we've talked about numerous ways to go about it, but at the end of the day, you're gonna. The idea is that the player crafts the character into the sort of player they want to see with selecting the skills they want, but they can't just go out and grab every single skill. And mm -hmm. there, there is a limit, but you'll just, uh, it's really not, it, here's the interesting thing. We're not going to have to worry so much about balance, um, like with World of Warcraft. All right, we've got the mage and we've got the death knight. Oh, dear God, the death knight is so overpowered. Let's nerf this and buff this with the mage and and all right that's a little more balanced here it's everybody starts out equal and craft their character into the way they would like to play the game and with the abilities that they would like for their player to have which means there will be quite a lot to select from and we've got some drawings of those we're just not yet to a point where we're ready to really uh, share it yet do you must start with money? Yeah, there will be like a, a set allowance that you get when yeah. you first start. Something I thought would be cool is uh, if you start a brand new character, it'd be neat because I think everybody does this. I know I, every single alt I've ever started in any RPG, I end up doing this sooner or later. You mail yourself money yeah, from your main. So why make somebody log in as their original character to do that? As soon as you create a new character, just go, just say, hey, I noticed you've got this other character. Would you like them to sponsor your new character? They've got this much money. How much of it would you like to give to your new character? And then in the game, you're literally sponsored by that other character. <laughs> they, they realize that you're coming to Aletheia as someone. They know you for, from whatever you can say, you know, like maybe they're relatives or they, you know, we're friends on the Internet. They're BFFs. And so <laughs> one, you know, so one sends <laughs> money to the other one without you having to go log in you, know, you what are you doing wow you create the character get him to a mailbox log out go log in as your other character find a mailbox drag some money over send them to the other guy log back out go back into your other character collect your money screw that yeah make it make it, i mean come on this is the electronic age in a couple thousand years from now. What would be really cool is, like, say you had several different mains and you're building your next alt, and this guy's got 1,000, this guy's got 2,000, this guy's got 500, and you can see them all. And you can say, like, well, I'm going to move 500 over from this guy, 200 from this guy, and then 300 from this guy, so it'll be a flat 1,000. I'll go ahead and send it to my dude. Boom, we're set. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. Yep. Okay, so any other direct questions regarding what you've heard so far? Again, I've got to reiterate, this is, this is it's just a rough draft right now. Yeah, it's just trying to get an idea of what we'd like to see in terms of the progression of player experience. But And I still stand behind the draft. fact that we're definitely going to be doing things that, some of the things that most of you guys will not like. That's right. And we're going to be doing them just because you won't like them, because that's how we are. No, I'm just kidding. Mostly. <laughs> So um, I'm not seeing any other questions, though. I'm looking, looking, looking. 
Let's uh, see. Army says, Busby J. So a lot of virtual reality, holographic events in the story. Will this mainly be for the humans? Are the Aletheans going to have something similar? Again, we've we've been discussing some <laughs> some things. We've okay, yeah, but we. I do, would love to tell you, but I can't. We do want to balance some stuff out. I'd have to kill you with interesting gameplay if you were to come in as an Aletheian. Yes, that's all I can say at the moment. Yeah, but it's really it's not hard to imagine how you could equivalent the whole thing. And if that why is a why is in question. Um, it's it's because we really don't want to share. Because we said so. Because we don't want to share very rough ideas until they get something a little bit more firmed up. Until we get past our initial argument stages that take place here. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead. Take a, a quick two-minute break for anyone who needs to go grab some coffee, bathroom, etc. I will go ahead and save this video. And then we'll come back, and we're going to switch gears and talk about some art. And um, and for those of you that like to draw, and especially Mr. Stevens, who's been doing a wonderful job on the, the human side of things. And I've seen some of his Aletheian stuff. He's got a great start there. But mm -hmm. Zach wants to present um, kind of the way he feels the, uh, the Aletheans should look as sort of a base to go from. And then let's see what kind of derivatives we can come from this base. So yep. with that, that is going to wrap up this video. We'll see you guys back in the next. Thanks a lot.